how quickly, uh, you know, a year in the Holocaust Museum goes. Uh, I'm Ryan Cooper, uh, outgoing chair of the Joseph Advisory Committee. We just had our last meeting upstairs, and what a wonderful meeting it was. Uh, I am very outgoing in more ways. <laughs> Uh, but we're very excited. We had a really great year. I've been on that committee for a million years, it feels like, but it's always enjoyable. And just a reminder, um, our goal at the beginning of this year was to provide you um, with more resources that you can add to your uh, metaphorical tool belt, um, as well as uh, opening the museum up to more people. Uh, so just in our term, uh, a reminder that we have provided uh, literary connection resources from the Diary of Anne Frank at night. Uh, that connect with items that we have in our museum. Mark Shankman has created a wonderful tour resource all about bystanders uh, under Lori Cooper's wonderful direction. Uh, round robins are now a well-oiled machine. Um, I'm sure she'll probably talk more about that at the docent luncheon. Uh, and then what I think is our cherry on top of the cake is starting the public walk-up tours that Sam chairs us this afternoon has already, just since January, seen 220 people who otherwise probably wouldn't have had a guided tour experience in this museum. We've seen them. And just the other month, I gave one that had well over 40, and I believe close to 50 people who came on that tour. So please share the fact that we have those tours um, on Sunday uh, mornings uh, to try and uh, get this museum's message out to more and more people. Uh, and so it's been an honor to be your chair of the committee, and I look forward to more and more things uh, in the future. And I'd like to hand it off to Dan for more information about the could I, hey Dan, could I make just a quick announcement before you sure. get the program started? Um, I, I put them in the docent lounge and I also put them out because I want people to utilize them. If you would, please give teachers the instructions as to how to access our old histories project on our website so, so, um, so we can get that rolling. We want to get that information out to as many people as possible. And then, yeah, here it is, it looks like this. Uh, you know, this is Chris hard work. We'd really like to capitalize on what we have done. And then students have the opportunity to listen to more oral history. They can be able to not just get the one they got when they came to the museum, but actually get more to more history. So please remember to do that. And you might want to listen to them as well. Yeah. Oh, there is that. There are a lot of testimonies in that repository uh, of survivors who are no longer here to speak. So. So it's a great year. So it's been a great year. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of the members of the Joseph Advisory Committee. It was an exceptionally lively year and a productive year in many ways. I want to thank you, recognize the new dosing class. If you're here, stand up. Them, but there's some future docents here and there in the group as well. So be on good behavior. So they'll want to join the group. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, speaking of docents, two of our docents are getting special recognition. This Sunday, May 19th at 1 o'clock, uh, there'll be a program of book launch of a book about docent Earl Solomon who, who uh, was a teacher for decades in East St. Louis. It's about his accomplishments uh, in that venue. It will also mark the fact that he's given his 1,000th tour here. He's on a tour right now that's almost finished. He's doing 1,001. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that'll be again from 1 to 3, and then that evening uh, on Mike Bush's program also about making change, there'll be a feature about uh, Earl and it does focus on the museum. So that's 10 o'clock on, is it KSDK? Yes. On KSDK, so check that out. Sunday the 19th at 10 p.m. 
Once it airs, then I'll get the clip for that story and put it on our Facebook page and email it to all of you. Hopefully you can see it live, but if you don't, we'll make sure you can see it. Very good. And uh, she's not here today, but uh, uh, May 22nd, the Jewish Light is honoring our community's unsung heroes. One of them is Julie Williams, active Joseph here, uh, recently just last year chair of our committee. Very active here and very active with many organizations and uh, involved in many projects around the St. Louis community. So uh, our congratulations, our congratulations to Julie. Uh, I want to mention our volunteer recognition brunch, which is June 13th. Correct. Yes. Uh, we could use. We want you to all come, eat, drink, enjoy. We could also use your help the day before Wednesday the 12th uh, in setting up. We could use your help cleaning up after. So. There's a sign-up list that I put next to the sign-in sheets on the counter outside of the door. If some of you would be willing, your assistance would be uh, much appreciated. I do want to mention it's a ways off, but on June 26th, Marie Christine Williams will be speaking about Triumph Over Darkness. That's the 26th, Wednesday. Uh, for the reception at 6.30, for uh, first speaking at 7, at the Missouri History Museum. Uh, Marie Christine Williams was the woman who lit the candle if you were at the Yom HaShoah commemoration. Her grandparents were survivors of the Holocaust in Romania. Her mother married a Rwandan, and she herself is a survivor of the genocide in Rwanda. So from the Shoah to the Rwandan genocide, her book, book is called The Dark Side of Human Nature, The Rwandan Massacre of April to July 1994, A Personal Story. And what's really wonderful is the topic is Triumph Over Darkness. It's really about how she survived, but really thrived and, uh, and has a very, very positive message. So uh, highly recommended and co-sponsored by the Holocaust Museum. And it's going to be at the History Museum? At the History Museum. At the History Museum. On the 26th. So the doors, we'll, the doors will open at 6.30 and the program will start at 7. So at 6.30 there is going to be a timeline about the Rwandan genocide, a lot of background information and context, and then she will speak at 7 o'clock. Um, I've been working with Bud on putting together some dose of travel. Now it's early days yet, but we'd like to put together a two-day trip to Washington, D.C. <coughs> sometime in the fall with uh, paying attention to the Jewish holidays, <coughs> but also to the numerous uh, uh, trips that are already scheduled, the Federation trip to Israel, several synagogues who plan trips. So we will work around those schedules. Would be two days, I know obviously details matter, like exact time and exact cost, but if I could just get a general idea of interest, who would at least like us to explore further if you'd raise your hand? Good. Enough hands to move to phase two. So, more information about that. So while I think about it, if you would turn on your cell phones and devices now. It's been a hectic morning uh, with me having computer problems, so I forgot anything. Jean or Lori, tell me now. Um, I was just thinking, since you're all an audience for the uh, volunteer luncheon and Earl's book signing, I'm going to just make a sign-up sheet that I'll put by the sign-in and, again, for the volunteer sign-up. Uh, so if you've already, already RSVP'd for either of those, I have your RSVP. You don't need to RSVP again. But if you know that you're coming to the volunteer luncheon or uh, Earl's book sign-in, you can just sign up. You can RSVP on a piece of paper I'm about to make right on the bookcase. <laughs> So the topic we're going to hear about, understanding the black experience in Nazi Germany, 
Now, general subjects has been something many of you have been asking for, asking that it be a subject of our monthly meeting for a long, long time. And it was a matter of finding the right person qualified to present the subject. So I want to thank Debbie for her persistence. And I want to thank a good friend and colleague, Brad Prager, for making the recommendation uh, for the speaker we have today, Kristen Kopp. There are colleagues at the University of Missouri in Columbia. Uh, Dr. Kopp received her PhD in German uh, with emphasis on film studies from the University of California, Berkeley. She is an associate professor of German studies at the University of Missouri, Columbia. She's an affiliated faculty member of the Film Studies Program and the Black Studies Program. Her courses cover German cultural history, German film and literature, the cultural history of blacks in Germany, Turkish immigration, German colonial studies, Nazi ideology and propaganda, and Weimar cinema. Her publications include Germany's Wild East, Constructing Poland as Colonial Space, which was published in 2012. She's edited several volumes, one on Berlin School Glossary and ABC of New Wave, of New, New Wave in German Cinema from 2013, and Germany, Poland, and Post-Memorial Relations, In Search of a Livable Past in 2012. Well, today her topic will be Understanding the Black Experience in Nazi Germany. Please give Kristen Kopp a warm welcome. Thank you. And four other pages of articles, presentations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, the presentation today I'm going, to, I'm going to give is based on a book that I'm currently co-authoring with a historian in London um, with whom I developed a course on the history of blacks in Germany that I teach at, um, at the zoo. And for that, it would be really helpful for us if we could collect some responses from the audience. So I'm going to ask you if you have a pad of paper that maybe you devote a sheet to me. I've got a lot of extra paper to pass out that maybe you could just have a sheet. And pass it around. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions over the course of my presentation that maybe you'll we'll jot down an answer to. But this is also a place where you can let me know if there's something that you found really interesting that I didn't cover enough. And maybe I'll ask you just to start out. I don't want you to write your names on this. I would prefer if they stayed anonymous. But it would be interesting for me to know whether you're a docent at the museum or if you're a member of the community. So maybe you could just write docent community member at the top just so I can sort out um, sort out the tools. And so the first question that I want to start out with um, is that Dan said and when he when he contacted me he let me know that especially the docents have been um, have been asking him for a while if someone could come in and talk about the history of blacks in the Nazi period. And we're really interested in knowing where that interest is coming from on your part. So if you, is, it, is, there, um, is there someone who you were giving a tour to who asked a question that sort of raised that issue for the first time? Um, where, do, you, do you remember when you first thought about this question or when you first had it? Do you have an anecdote for me of some kind? And just, I'm, we're very interested in um, where the interest is coming from now because for the past 10 years the history of blacks in Germany has been an incredibly richly researched topic. I have brought um, a slew of books in German and English that have all been published in the past decade about, I mean some of them are memoirs from black Germans, some of them are um, monographs written about black Germans, there's a, um, a, a catalog from a museum exhibit. So the, there's, a, there's a lot of interest that's been generated in the past decade, and we're interested in thinking about um, why. Um, um, 
called No Man's Land, or in English it's called Hell on Earth. He stars in this movie at a time when the American production code would hardly let black and white people be in the same film at all. He stars in, an anti, in a German anti-war film from 1931, where he has the star role in, um, in, in bringing men from different countries that find themselves st stuck in a bunker together, um, where he brings them to understand each other because he's the only one who's multilingual as a traveling performer. He speaks a little bit of English, a little bit of German, a little bit of French, and he can you know, make that uh, communicated. This is on YouTube if you're interested with English subtitles. So it's a great film um, and, he, and he starred in it, right? So Germany in the 20s and 30s, up until 33, but in some cases even after that, which is one of the problems we're going to talk about today, Germany is a great place for African Americans to go. African American performers are getting better audiences, making more money, interacting way easier with the population on the ground than they are here in the United States. Classical musicians are going to Germany to train in opera and in lead singing. So Germany, um, Germany in the in, you know in the 20s and 30s, very rich cultural grounds for African Americans. And then the third one that I want to talk about um, is this, this, uh, this episode of the Rhine occupation after World War I. So you know that after World War I, Germany loses a lot of land in the east um, to Poland. And it also, um, it's also the Rhineland is occupied by the French military, who then subsequently occupies the Ruhr Valley. And really, oh, and so to kind of think about um, maybe sort of gender and sexuality of the Rhineland, this is a propaganda poster from 1916 during the war, and it says the Rhine will remain German. And if we look at the imagery here, it's incredibly sexualized and phallic, right? We've got the naked German Aryan man who's staving off, you know, by bending the, let's say, phallic swords attacking from France, right, but to protect against the murder or rape, let's say, of the, 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 the German woman, right? So and the Rhine is running between his legs. So this kind of very, um, gender sexuality propaganda. So imagine now that what France does is occupy the Rhineland with its French colonial troops. It's from Senegal, largely. And that these French troops arrive in a post-war landscape that's been decimated and where the male population of marriageable men has been killed, you know, to, right? Large numbers of men have been killed women don't have marriage and sexual partners, and in come these handsome, well-fed, healthy, not PSD-ridden soldiers from France. There's a lot of fraternization that takes place with these soldiers, and a lot of babies, hundreds of babies, are born out of the Rhineland occupation with black soldiers. We don't know how many more were born of white soldiers, but we, we have a rough idea about the black population. Um, and so this is now the, um, the Rhineland being occupied with these black soldiers from France. And you can imagine that the response was, um, uh, the propaganda response was extremely intense because this was an occupation of defeat and because the, it, was the, it was an occupation that took place as Germany had lost its own colonies, Germany had been told it was not fit to be a colonial master, and now they saw themselves being occupied, being colonized by black soldiers from, from the French troops. So this, this immediate role reversal was experienced as very humiliating, and the propaganda was extremely vulgar and very sexualized. So if we think about that propaganda poster about the war, now we're going to see the propaganda posters talking about the black horror on the Rhine. 
right? And and the 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 propaganda is all insinuating that these women are not voluntarily entering into these relationships, that they're being raped by these men. It, this is not the case. Um, there, lots of studies have been done about the nature of these relationships. Children were born out of sustained relationships that women were having with these soldiers that were present in the Rhineland. So, I mean, you can just see, I mean, this is a collector's coin with, you know, the penis on the right that the woman is strapped to. I mean, the, sort of the rape and sexual violation imagery is really strong. This was a postcard, you know, just like a, I don't, I don't really get the whole postcard thing, that why you would send a postcard and something like this, but, you know, the, you know, how long is this still going to last, the question says on the bottom, as the woman is being sexually violated by black men um, on the top. I mean, you know, you know these, you know these magazines. These are cover images of all of the illustrateds. You can find this, um, this vulgar imagery. But this one I thought was particularly interesting for us today because part of what happens ultimately is that the black presence in Europe gets explained as a product of the Jewish conspiracy, right? So we see the Jewish figure on the right who's obviously bankrolling this, um, this racial um, defilement of the Rhineland, right? So it ties in together with, with our anti-Semitic themes. Okay, so um, I want to think about now these three populations that I've named. I've named the colonial, the, the, the stranded colonials, the African American performers and intellectuals, and the, the children now that have been born out of this occupation. When we think of blackness and we think of black people, we tend to lump them all into one group, and when we see a black person, it's just a black person that belongs to the black population. Germans have never been that way. They have always seen black diversity. They've always looked at black people as belonging to specific black groups that are different from each other. It was much different to be an African American traveling through Europe than it was to be the child of the occupation. It was much different to be an African American intellectual studying in Berlin than it was to be one of these colonial subjects stranded in Germany. And today, it's way different to travel in Germany or in Austria as an African American than it is to be there as a Nigerian refugee. They know immediately who belongs to what group when you're walking down the street, right? So we, one of the things, one of the main takeaways of my lecture today is that we need to be thinking in terms of diverse groups of black people that were seen very differently by the Germans and by the Nazis as well. So I mean Germans and German Nazis, right? I mean, thinking about all of the Germans, everyone is seeing different groups as they're looking. And so these groups are going to be treated very differently. They're going to have extremely different experiences under the Nazis. So one thing that we, oh, sorry, no. so the first thing that we need to know, okay, uh, is that there is a sustained propaganda campaign all the way through Weimar, all the way through the Nazi period to get those African colonies back. There's a fantasy that we're going to get those colonies back, and when we do, we need these African post-colonials that are trapped in Germany, right? We want them to go back, and we want them to say good things about us, so we better make sure that we treat them well. They are going to be the future mediators between us, the colonial masters, and the colonized population. They speak German, they have German experience, they're going to be that kind of upper class that runs things in the colonies. So there's an ambivalence here with these colonial subjects. On the one hand, they're colonial subjects who we're looking down upon because they're colonials. On the other hand, we have this dream of the return, it says, here too is German land, right? This idea that that space down there is German, we want to get it back. Colonials are going to play an important role in that. So there's a strong tension 
with the colonial um, population. Oh, it did do that. Oh, this is really too bad. Okay, so you turn your head sideways and you like squint. <laughs> um, what I was trying to show you was a map from 1936 that's showing the black population in the United States. Because hey, one of the things that, that I need to tell you today, like, like the extent of where, you know, like the uh, density of black populations in the United States. I think this is just a Mac PC thing. It's okay. It, it's the only slide. It's the only slide that that does that. Everyone has already turned sideways and started to rise. So, um, I mean, it's just 1936. And, and the point that I want to make here is that Hitler and the Nazis are very much looking at the United States. They are very much looking at our Jim Crow race laws. And they are very much saying, you know what, the Americans got it right. And it becomes the basis of the Nuremberg race laws, uh, which I just, yeah, I have a whole bunch of books here, but one that I just want to show you is this one. And this is all about how Jim Crow is translating in the Nuremberg race laws, how they were looking right at us to get their model for what they were doing. Took it right from us. <laughs> we did it first. So this, you know, this propaganda that they're saying, this is 1936, right? This is the Olympics, right? Olympics in, under Hitler in Germany. And there's a lot of propaganda now about how horrible the Americans are. Well. Not uh, how horrible can they be? Maybe how right the Americans got it. I don't know. But this public, right? So there's a lot of discussion now about what's happening in the United States with our race situation. And part of what they're saying is, how come you guys are all coming to us and talking to us about how we are discriminating against the Jews or treating them badly? Are we not, indeed, just doing what you guys are doing right back there in the United States? And they were right. Right. Okay, and so W. B. B. Du Bois, who went to Germany in the in the eighteen nineties to study in Berlin for two years, loved it, had the best experience of his life. Said, "I finally discovered what it felt like to be treated like a real man." Traveled all over Europe, worked with worked with uh, 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 Weber, like was, was noted, you know, was, was received by everybody in Berlin. See the mustache of Wilhelm? He wears this mustache till the end of his life out of his Germanophilia. He travels to Germany again in 1936. He's there for five months. He travels all over the country and he writes back and he says, you know, this thing that's going on with the Jews is not okay, but I had a great time. 1936, African Americans in Germany, not a problem. Jesse Owens, right, big deal. So a lot of sports that, uh, 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 Joe, Joe Lewis, Joe Lewis, oh, sorry. Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling, right. So, but, but, uh, our, our African-American athletes who are in, this is again, this is 1936. Um, and, and this is now, I'm moving over from, uh, from the uh, Americans now to uh, my first person I want to talk about in detail, Hans Jürgen Massacoy. Because Massacoy in his um, autobiography, which I also have up here, he wrote it in English for reasons I'll explain in a minute. He wrote it in English, and he talks about how he, as a school child, got to go with his class to see Jesse Owens race in the Olympics. He went and saw Jesse Owens there. And he talks about how he had wanted to join the Hitler Youth. They were having so much fun, and he really wanted to join. And when they did, and when he got this swastika emblem, he made his mother sew it on all of his clothes this the swastika that he has on his vest. He came home all happy that he had finally gotten this patch and got it sewed onto everything. They did not let Hans Jürgen join the Hitler Youth, but there are blacks who did join the Hitler Youth. They were allowed in and joined with great enthusiasm because 
the Hippo Youth was where everyone was having a fun time. They were going camping, doing the fun stuff. But also, it was your ticket into the career world. So we're going to return to another person. Oh, and I just want to say, Massive Boy survives the war, comes to the United States, and becomes the chief editor of Ebony Magazine, run by an Afro-German. Yeah. Uh, another subject, Theodor Michel Bonyak, still alive. If you Google him, there are awesome YouTube videos of him. Massacre just died a couple of years ago. Uh, Theodor uh, Michel is still alive, um, still uh, talking about um, one of his main topics are the people shows that he actually performed in during the, uh, during the Weimar period and the Nazi period also survived in the country during the war, also tried to join the Hitler Youth, also tried to join the Wehrmacht, um, was brought in uh, two times to be, whatever, checked out, and was rejected twice, and now late in life he says, thank God, because I don't know that I wouldn't have acted like every other German. I'm a German, and I probably would have committed atrocities alongside other Germans. So he's grateful today for the fact that he was not allowed in. A sentiment shared by many of the Afro-Germans who, um, who survived the war. Um, these are his parents on the far left. It's a very famous image because it's really gorgeous of his bourgeois parents um, getting married uh, during World War I, and then the married couple with their children. Marie Nayar, also still alive, um, and she also wrote an autobiography, unfortunately not translated into English yet. Also videos, videos of her with English subtitles on YouTube. Um, an incredibly attractive personality. She's really, she's extremely short, and she's really cute. And in the 1950s, she became a, a, a singer called Leila Negra, who sang this this hit song in 1952, Mach nicht so traurige Augen, weil du ein Negerlein bist. So don't cry because you're a Negro. Anyway, um, that was uh, kind of her. I mean, and so um, also tried to join the Bundesmädel, also rejected, um, not allowed to do that. Um, I don't have pictures of a couple people that I want to talk about. <coughs> But Hans Hauch is interviewed, he's interviewed uh, along with uh, another person I'm going to talk about in this really great book called Other Germans um, by Tina Kant. And the interviews with these two subjects are extremely interesting. Hans talks about um, how he joined the Wehrmacht, again, how it was his ticket into um, the, his job with the railway that he had how he then um, joined the Wehrmacht and was, was in the military through the war. He also talks about how he was forcefully sterilized at age 15. And this brings me to um, an important chapter that involves the Rhineland occupation babies. So the Rhineland occupation babies, who are sort of clustered in that geographical region, are a real thorn in the consciousness of people in that region as a sign of their women sleeping with the enemy, right? I mean, that's really what we're talking about. And these visible symbols or signs, these visible signs of women having slept with the enemy are running around in the Rhineland as a reminder of that shameful, humiliating experience of having been occupied. And so they reach a decision in 35 that they are going to sterilize this population of black children. And they do it intentionally, but secret, it's an open secret. So they bring the child in, into a, like a court setting. They, they determine that the child is um, des deservable of eugenic sterilization and then they schlep them off to the hospital and do it. They did it to over almost 500 children, forcefully sterilized in two years, from 35 to 37. Just in the Rhineland. 
Hans Hauch is sterilized in the Rhineland. Massacoy, who's living in Hamburg, is not. Um, Terravonia is not. They're living elsewhere in Germany, and this program is localized in the Rhineland. So again, black people having very different experiences depending on where they were living and their black identity, their, not their black identities, their identities as Americans, colonials, French occupation babies. Um, this isn't Hans Hauch, but it's another, um, it's another Afro-German who um, also uh, joined the military, just, to, just so that you'd have an image. Fasia Janssen, also, this is so fascinating, she's the other um, main interviewee in Tina Camp's book, Other Germans. Fasia tried to join the, the, um, uh, the, the Bundesmail, was rejected, um, but was conscripted into the forced national service during the war. And most of her uh, classmates, her female classmates, they were doing things like house cleaning for, you know, in families that, where they needed help. She, however, got sent to the concentration camp. But not as an inmate, she was sent to work in the concentration camps as a cook. And so we have, an, you know, again, this, um, if I, I, this cognitive dissonance of a person that we would expect to be an inmate in the camp who's actually working in the camp and going home at night, right, as a, as a cook in the camp. So this is Fasia Janssen. And when, when one of the fascinating things that comes out in these interviews is the way, and in fact, in all of these memoirs, when I look at Marina Yar's memoir, or Massacoy's memoir, or even Tara Bonia's um, autobiography, all of them really refuse an identity as a victim. They say, yeah, you know, the Nazis were, you know, like the Nazis were doing bad things. I suffered as a consequence of that. But so many Germans were there helping me out. Marie Nayar, this cute little girl growing up in Hamburg, had had some encounter with the police um, a couple of years before the Nazis came to power, and they were so charmed by her. And she would go, to, she would like in her play, she would go to the police station and kind of talk to them and stuff. So when the police got orders to like register black people or whatever it was, they would take the document, they would do all kinds of passive resistance things, like feed the document down the stack so that it never got to the top. She never had any problems coming up through the war. She found out later that she was protected from that. Hans-Jürgen Massapoy, same thing, said there were laws you know, against you know, who can play in the playground. And his mother went and talked to the, the playground director, and it's like, come on, it's, it's Hans Jürgen. Like, you all know this kid. And they're like, yeah, that's our Hans Jürgen. Of course he can play in the playground. And so there was this real, um, this problem that the Nuremberg race laws were extremely um, articulate in their anti-Jewish measures. They named Jews specifically <coughs> And then sometimes they mentioned non-Aryans. But all of the Nuremberg race laws are so targeted towards the Jewish population specifically that it was always a local decision whether or not these rules and laws also applied to black people. And in many cases, local people decided that they did not. And it's, it's, again, cognitive dissonance. We need to think about what, how do we explain this? Why would this have been the case? One, you know, one reason also is because this population is so small. We don't have any statistics. They were never collected. Um, and so estimates range anywhere between 1,000 and 25,000 individuals total, not grouped into neighborhoods, not collected in communities really of any kind, but dispersed, you know, and maybe with a little bit of density in the Rhineland, but otherwise kind of dispersed over the country. And most scholars say, you know, had Hitler stayed in power and, you know, had the Nazis stayed in power, we know what would have come next. 
We know the Slavs were on the list, so you know what would have happened to the black people most likely, and they just never got there. So what did these black people do then during this period? And in the case of the colonials, there was a real problem with, um, with um, unemployment. They were kicked out of professions. They were. They were kicked out of professions. Or, you know, a company is scaling down and they were the first ones to be let go, you know? So they, they were really having a problem with employment. And this Africa show becomes the answer to that in 1936, and it goes all the way into the war to 1940. This is a people show, a traveling people show. And Hans Jürgen Massakoy, when his parents died, he ended up as a child in one of these shows. It was basically all the black people got put into something that was supposed to be like the people shows of the turn of the century where they went to the zoo and they set up a village and you could come and look at the animals and then look at the Africans in the zoo. And this is the same principle um, carried on by the Nazis. And, and very, very many of the black people that were in Germany at the time found themselves um, in the Afrika show. But even more than this, we see them in film. And this, and so they're getting, they're getting channeled to the entertainment industry, either in the Africa show or in film or doing jazz music, right? So those kind of until Hitler because jazz, okay. so, but you know, through, throughout this period, um, Louis Brody uh, becomes the most famous black actor. I said we were going to see him again, and here he is. Um, he stars in a wide range of films. All of the. Um, all of the sort of adventure films that take place abroad or in, or in the in the Orient or in Africa, he's in all of them. So this is Owen Kruger at the bottom. Um, this is the Tiger von Eschnapur at the top, and this is his business card as a. I mean, really just showcasing. Here's my black body. Use it in the films, right? So this this is Louis Brody. Um, this film, Germanen, is made during the war, and all of those black people are French prisoners of war that were forced into uh, performing as extras in the film. Um, Mohamed Houzen, I said that we would see him again, and here he is because he also um, becomes a star in films. This one is uh, a war film set in German East Africa where he's playing an Ascari soldier. He plays in Carl Pinter's, you see him there uh, behind, uh, um, uh, I can't think of who that is, but okay. Uh, so these are the from his, his um, career in film. Okay, so, so this is, I mean, for, sort of thinking about survival strategies, this is, um, Survival looks like, um, in some cases, trying to join in with the German organizations. In very few cases, but important ones, gaining access to the Hitler Youth and the Wehrmacht and careers in that way. Um, a great majority being, being pressured into entertainment industry in one way or the other. Um, and. Um, Oh, and now I want to talk about resistance because, and I, and I actually need to start with Hilarious Gilges because he is one of the first victims of Nazi, um, uh, of Nazi uh, assassinations. So he's a black performer, um, uh, like, a, like a street theater performer, but he's a political activist. He's a communist activist. And in 1933, his body is found uh, floating in the river. So he's one of the first opposition figures that um, that's that we memorialize in this way. Um, hilarious Gilges. Um, Anton de Kamm um, is uh, was from Suriname. He's this, this is sort of Dutch coming in. Uh, he's also killed as a resistance figure um, for fighting. Um, for the for the communists, he's a communist in the Netherlands, 
but his, um, his activism is about the Nazi mistreatment and violent mistreatment of others. And so he's very concerned about how the Jews are being treated and how blacks um, relate to that oppression. And he is um, a kill. Um, so those two. Another resistance figure, you know Josephine Baker. I just want you to know, I mean, maybe you know this. You know she was born here in St. Louis. And you know that she was you know, one of the most famous performers in Weimar. But did you guys also know that she was a spy? Yes, yeah, so some of you knew she was a spy. So she had the privilege of mobility. She, would, she was traveling throughout this period. She's crossing borders. She's going from country to country. And in her music notes, she's smuggling documents. So Josephine Baker, um, you know, she has this other cooler side <laughs> as, a, as the spy. Um, and then when we come to the concentration camps, the first thing that I want to say is that the, that the blacks are not sent to the concentration camps for being black. There are black people in the concentration camps, but this typically isn't about their blackness. It's typically about their politics, um, about their opposition. Um, okay, no, okay. And in the case of, um, of um, Mohammed Hussein, who we saw, I suppose this is a case of him being black. He had a wife, a, a German wife, and a German mistress that were all living together, and he was having children with both women. And I think at some point, this was just like pushing the envelope too far. And, uh, and he ended up, he was killed, and he landed in the concentration camps for racial mixture, and he died there. Johnny Voste um, is Belgian and um, was uh, survived Dachau, uh, was in, in, in the camp there. Uh, okay, so there was one more, you know, this one actually might have been interesting to think about starting this with my company, because this is showing where the camps are. I'll, I'll make this available to you guys so you can see. Do you want me to flip it real quick? Yeah, if you, if you can do it. Um, so that, that would be by the Nazis in the Mediterranean and survived a, um, a march from camp to camp that started in southern Italy and, um, and landed in Mauthausen where he survived there rather miraculously, um, extremely traumatized, refused to talk to her about it his whole life, and she is now in the process of I'm uh, really working through uh, a post-trauma of her own. But, uh, she's going to have a memoir coming out about all of that pretty soon. Um, and in Austria, they are um, they're looking into these cases, and she's been brought there to present on, on her dad and his, uh, his life. Um, and then, 
I just want to go to the post-war period really briefly before I finish, because what happens after World War II is that we occupy the American, uh, the American zone, and we stay you know, in Germany until 1989 in large numbers. 20 million Americans were stationed in, in Germany. Think about that, 20 million. And 3 million of them were African American. And especially in the 1940s and 50s, this is really impactful. We send a Jim Crow military to democratize Germany. The irony. Um, and everybody saw the hypocrisy. Everybody saw it. The Germans saw it, the Americans saw it, everyone saw it. African Americans, I mean, in the, in the American sector, one of the most commonly shared experiences of Germans is to recount the first American they ever met, who was typically a black American GI who gave them candy as a child. And why was it black GI? And one of the reasons for this is because the black uh, units were given service jobs. They were driving the trucking lines. They were carrying the chocolate and the coffee and the food and the things that the desperate Germans, you know, starving and, and, and decimated really needed. So they had a much, um, uh, a much more immediate interaction with the Germans in the, in the beginning. Um, but also, the Germans said that after they got, they got past the whole propaganda of, you know, black people have tails and things like that, I mean, once, the, you know, once that was kind of taken care of, they found that the black Americans were way kinder to them, that the white Americans were much more arrogant, and the black Americans re related to them in a much easier way. And, so fraternization, of course, illegal, but there's a lot of fraternization going on, and the law gets rescinded a year later because they just can't, you know, they, there's just, you can't, you've got millions of men. And these men, right, they're there for two years, three years, they're not living in barracks. They're living in the houses with the people. They're living amongst the population, living with the Germans in the population, and there's a lot of fraternization with our African-American GIs as well. This now is going to be um, the, 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 the pool out of which a new generation of Afro-Germans is born. Many Afro-Germans today um, uh, trace their roots to American GIs who were stationed in Germany um, who had children. Often, um, these, so these relationships were very largely, again, just like after World War I, consensual, um, and often uh, it was very difficult for anyone to get married to a German. I mean, everybody probably knows someone who brought home a German war bride, right? I mean, or at least you've heard about this. Um, but those marriages had to be okayed on the ground by a hierarchical series of officers. And, um, and the woman had to undergo, like, you know, a Nazi purity check and, you know, blah, 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 and had to be accepted as a wife for the American. And in most of the cases when black men applied for marriage, which they did in great numbers, it was denied them. And they had to return to the U.S to U.S. soil in order to be discharged from the military. And once they were here, what, what means did they have of getting back to Germany where, where they had girlfriends and children, right? So um, this is a really ugly, it's a really ugly chapter of our military history um, that we had this Jim Crow military. We didn't officially desegregate until, until 48, and de facto, it took much longer than that. Um, and part of it really was the Germans saying, this doesn't work, right? You can't be coming here and telling us that democracy means everybody is equal and everyone, you know, one man, one vote, or whatever, when you're not doing that in the US. Like, you know. So the hypocrisy was just so blatant. 
that it pressured the U.S. government and the U.S. military towards this measure of desegregating um, the military. So that's uh, kind of a quick overview of Weimar and beyond. Um, but I'm really interested to know um, what questions you have. We have time. Dan, we're good. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. What kind of population are you talking about? Uh, so the total number of black population what the discussion? Thousands? That's what I'm saying. There, there are no statistics about how many black people were in Germany um, during the Weimar period. I've seen 1,000. I've seen 25,000. Thousands, but not, but not hundreds of thousands. And today, there's about a half a million. It's about 500,000. Um, uh, black people resident in Germany today. I, I understand about the Rhineland babies, but why were the um, the blacks that were from the original German colonies? Why were some of them accepted into Hitler Youth or you know into mainstream, and others were turned away? What what is the reasoning? So this is this is really the, um, the the specificity of the black history is that these decisions were locally made by individual people. Um, so it really meant that 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 you know uh, child A shows up to adult B who kind of says yeah okay. Child C comes to adult D and they're like no. So it was very, it was, it was arbitrary. I mean, it was like the arbitrariness of, of individual opinion, individual mindset, because the laws themselves were so vague about whether or not they applied to black people. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I heard that there was a problem with after war black children Germany. I'm from Poland. I heard that those things. Uh, the, 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 the press was talking about the problem of uh, GI's children in Germany. What do you know about that after the war? Yeah, um, it's a it's a multifaceted, really difficult, um, and very interesting history. Um, so the the first problem being that, like I said, um, in many cases, the, the father wanted to marry the mother and raise the child in Germany, did not want to come back to the United States and raise them here, and that was usually not allowed. So the children are now the children of single mothers, mostly, and that meant that the, the state was the guardian of the child. Mm -hmm. The state got to decide what would happen to that child. And in many cases, what the state, what the, rep, what, what the representative of the state, right? Because again, no real clear rules. The representative of the state would decide it would be better for that child to not live with you and to be sent to an orphanage. Mm -hmm. That happened in many cases. Not that the mother wanted that, but she would get pressured into giving up the child. Um, that happened a lot. Many were adopted to the United States. And there was a very interesting debate that took place in Germany about those adoptions because they were like looking at the child as a black child. They were thinking, well, better that it go be in the United States and be around other black people. But as a German child, they were saying, how could we possibly send this child to the United States where there's lynchings and discrimination and Jim Crow, and how could we possibly send our German child into that hellhole? So there was a real spectrum of opinion about what should happen to these children depending on how they were perceived, again, individually. <clears throat> and, and many of them, are, they're in Germany, I mean, they're in Germany now, um, with, a lot of, um, with a lot of success stories and a lot of trauma um, involved with that whole episode, especially the ones that were sent away to the orphanages. That was really, um, that was a really horrible 
So much of the Nuremberg laws were about, about mixed marriages and keeping Jews separate from Germans. Did those laws address these different groups of Africans that were living in Germany? You know? no. They're not named. It's so interesting. They're not named. And sometimes the word non-Aryan is used. And then you have then again the individual person had to make the decision, does non-Aryan, is that just code word for Jew? Or does that mean anyone who's not ethnically white white German? Does this apply to the African or not? Local decisions made on the ground by individual people who arbitrarily could decide one way or the other. Yeah? That doesn't surprise me. Because the history of anti-Semitism in Germany is long. And the government could count on people hating the Jews. They couldn't count on them hating the blacks because there hadn't been that many. Yeah. And I think there's a yeah. lot of laws were specifically yeah. to I mean, make Germany yeah. human or not. And remember that blackness was coded in so many different ways, right? Du Bois is what he gets marriage proposals. I, I forgot to say all of this, right? He's dating a German woman that he is totally in love with. And the parents want her to marry him, and she's an aristocrat. But this isn't, this is, right? They, everyone is like, oh, you'll, this will be a you know, beautiful marriage. And he's the one who says, no, I really need to go back to the United States and work on our race issues there, and I can't bring her home and to, to, to do it. You know, I can't do it. Um, blacks that were in Germany, African Americans that were in Germany at the time, were not having a hard time getting dates. I, do, I mean, it's just, so like this whole, where, what was the stereotype? There wasn't just one. There were many. And it was, there were different pools of people that were not interchangeable, you know? So, yeah. So basically, if I'm understanding, there are, maybe there were 25,000 <coughs> dispersed throughout the country. Yeah. So they basically didn't live in fear of being rounded up. It was if their political views got in the way. Yeah, they never were rounded up. There was never, the, the, the one concentrated action was that semi-secret sterilization campaign in the Rhineland. And aside from that, there was never any campaign to do anything with the black population as such. We have a poster here with um, an African German with the earring, and we have with the star. It's a very famous poster and mm -hmm. red. Yeah, propaganda. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Okay, so jazz, jazz from like degenerate art. Yeah, yeah. 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 Degenerate yeah. music. Degenerate music. music. So the jazz was in a way the intellectual was a way to get in and be part of accepted in the population, but then it was also in contrast considered degenerate. Yes. And they have it with the Jew. So it's not, and, and the face looks like a monkey. So there's, they're definitely making a statement about African Germans. Could you elaborate on that? No. Uh, I think they're making a statement about, um, um, so that is, so you're right, it's the, it's the degenerate music um, right. exhibit, I guess. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, it's actually a the opera was based on, and they took the score cover, which was not a black, uh, and, and made it into a popular industry. And, and what, but it wasn't a poster for any kind of event, or it was just... Well, just yeah, it was, it was, I think it was instigated by the performance of Johnny Spiel. Oh, okay. So just a poster that was... Johnny Spiel. Okay, so it was a poster that was that was hung when that was supposed to come to Vienna, right? And they okay. No, I think it was in the streets. I mean, I think it was a very popular poster. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just, but but I think it was unleashed. It was it was printed in response to Johnny Spiel. Was a was a, uh, a musical with jazz music in it that was uh, being protested. And so, yeah, I, I think that what happened was this poster was made to protest the appearance of that, which was forbidden to play in many places as a result of the protest. But it's a 
Bolster that represents all the other groups that were persecuted, and the main figure is black. Yeah. So I always wondered, so what, what were the black people persecuted? I didn't really know, but that poster seems to say that. Yeah. Um, so the po the poster is really about the jazz music, and for, for the opponents of jazz, um, there was there was a, an attack, and so. But my the Nazi opponents of jazz were interested in lumping together something like an American jazz with an African primitivity into one this one stereotypical image that we know from colonial advertising, right? The the, the huge red lips, the big bugged out white eyes, like that dehumanized right. image, right? And they they were interested in lumping that all together because for them, jazz was a threat because it was American, it was hip amongst the kids, it was not very German. So that, so, um, I see what you're saying, that it kind of seems like it represents all black people, and maybe in that poster it does, but it still doesn't change this this other this other reality that these groups were different and seen as different. And there was no way that the colonial uh, subjects were were involved in the jazz thing, even though they were the most African of the people there, you know? Maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I told George Rich that the subliminal message of that was that these creatures were human. Yeah. Jews and, and uh, gypsies and, uh, and the blacks and the blacks. Yeah. Even though you're saying there was no national policy, mm -hmm. there wasn't. But there wasn't. It doesn't mean. I mean, it doesn't mean that there wouldn't have been someone who would have said, "We need to create this poster against. You know, we need to make sure that black people are included in this." Um, Nazis that were from the Rhineland were way more prominent to have that kind of um, um, actively anti-black posture. But it's still, it really begs the question, I mean, and researchers, they're, they're still just trying to figure this out. How do we explain the fact that, that the Nuremberg laws weren't systematically, why weren't they systematic? It wasn't that they didn't know that there were black people there. I mean, it wasn't that they like forgot about that. They, somehow decisions were made to leave some of this vague, and it might have been, um, it might have been, and an, an some kind of um, calculation about how Americans were going to respond to the anti-Jewish measures, and that they could say, "But look at what you guys are doing to black people, and you're not doing that." It could have been something like that. Again, it could have been the we need to we need to just not um, we need to make sure that these colonials can go back to the colonies when we get the colonies back, and we don't we don't want to we don't want to um, turn them against us not too much or whatever because the because again and again and again the the results of the research are showing that there was no systematicity here and and how we. How do we explain that lack of, I mean, why wasn't it all the same? You would think it would have been all the same. Oh, can I just give it a Yeah. This is one great big who knew, right? Um, the poster, though, that, that folks here are talking about, there's, there's the, the, the grotesque looking, I use the word grotesque when I'm pointing it out as a joke, grotesque looking black face, simian, very, very much so, but there's there's also a star of David on it, and there's an earring which we attribute to the gypsies. Um, maybe that's not correct. And then there's the saxophone, which is not a symphony instrument, a jazz instrument, and jazz being a product of black Americans and a few Jews throwing it as well. That's part of how I present it. Um, that's in the same corner of the museum with. The, the, the piece about race mixing, the, the uh, Aryan man and the uh, apparently Jewish uh, woman he affiliated with. And then there's next to that, there's 
one of the charts about race mixing, in, including how an Aryan and, and a non-Aryan, like a black, like like a, an Asian, uh, 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 and like a Jew, becomes Michelin. So those are all together in the museum. How are we to sort that out in terms of the race problem? The not not Aryan. I would imagine the Nazis did not want. Uh, sure, they did not want the race mixing part, but they were out to get the Jews for other reasons besides calling the Jews a separate race. They hated the Jews as much because they associated them with Marxism. So, how do we, how do we uh, unravel all that? Yeah. <laughs> do you want me to take a picture of that area and show you? So yeah. You can, yeah. I can run out and take a picture. Yeah. Yeah. And you know we're all we're all thinking of it, and then you can be on yeah, the same page. Yeah. I think that may be something we have to deal with in a larger. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think that that's a that's a really that's a really difficult question. I don't think there is an easy. I don't think there's an easy answer. But, but, I, but I can't make it. I'll just plug a book that I just think is the very best starting point. It's Clarence Lucian's book called The Hitler's Black Victims, and he gives a real rundown. I mean, this is the the kind of the primary monograph that's just that treats all of this history, Hitler's black victims. His last name is L U S A N E, Clarence of Sand. And it's, it's just a very good place to start. It's not that it's going to answer your question, but yeah. What my opinion about it? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Heavy colonies was very prestigious. England had it, France had it, Germany had lost to the table. So they they had good attitudes to this blacks from the colonies because that was the sign of empire of being a big country. Right? And who came there were all educated people. So it was prestigious to have colonies. Yeah, yeah. At some point. I mean, it's the only reason they wanted them back. They never made money off the British colonies. Yeah, that's it. They wanted them back because that's what it meant to be colonial. I mean, what, is, what, what, what was it? An empire. An empire was an entity that had overseas colonies. It was yeah, just like a legal thing. They had profits on colonies. No, they, they never made money off the colonies. Never. They lost tons of money. Anything else I can ask you or answer? Really? I got there. Besides, I can do that. Then can I? Yeah. Uh, we talked more about Jesse Owens and how he was there because we were taught like, that you know Hitler wouldn't give him his medal and wouldn't acknowledge him, and then you said that, you know he was okay with his family. Yeah. Um, first of all, while well, I answer that. The question that I, so I want you to write down anything that you think I should know or think about. I mean, you can send me any kind of messages you want. But I would, I'm, I'm interested when you're looking at this, um, because I'm not a, a Holocaust expert. I'm interested in how you're seeing the similarities and differences between the black experience and the Jewish one. And maybe I could just say, like, what is the main similarity or difference, or not more than three? Like, just because um, I want to see how you're processing this information. So what feels similar, what feels different between the black case and the Jewish case for you? And, and in Jesse Owens' um, case, that there was that story that Hitler wouldn't shake his hand, and now it's not really clear whether or not that was a myth or whether that really happened. Um, but they they had they had a great time in Germany. That's what I mean. That's what it's just. I mean, and, and Du Bois in the exact same years that they um, that they were. Um, out, you know, again, living outside of Jim Crow for that, for that while. They were not discriminated against in that kind of a way. So it felt really different. He is quoted as, I can say, he got treated better in Germany when he came back home in the United States. But it wasn't just him. There were a lot of Russians. I mean, 
mean, it wasn't just him, it was basically every African American who went there said they would treat it better there than they were here. I mean, there aren't really exceptions to that. As opposed to the Jewish athletes who were miserable and not permitted to compete with the lot like Marty Glickman. I mean, that just, just, it just, it just, it just, and, 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 and part of it is perception, right? Because it wasn't that it wasn't that black people in Nazi Germany had just as easy of a time as white people in Nazi Germany or in Germany. Period. It's just that coming from the United States and going there, it felt like I mean, not not in paradise, but it felt like I can walk down the street, I can talk to German women, I can date them. I can go to the bar, I can go to the movies, I don't have to be segregated, I'm not being humiliated on a constant basis out in public. It was really liberating <coughs> throughout this whole period. That's the well, yeah. it's like a problem. No, fun. They couldn't fight the U.S. Army because yeah. they wouldn't have been accepted. Yeah. Whereas when they fought with the French soldiers, they were fine. They were treated as, as communists. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, and the same type of experience, right? I, I I had to go abroad in order to feel and be treated like a real man, and then I come home, and in many cases, soldiers that came home in uniform were lynched, right? And why? Because now you've had some, you know, I I can see in your face that you've had some experience of not being humiliated and demoralized, and I'm going to make sure that that doesn't spread like the virus, right? I mean, there was so much hostility to men that came home in uniform, or men that had served and knew it. Well, and I think that's the answer. One answer to your question is Then, then maybe in a way we really can see these as mirror, as mirror efforts, as, as mirror cases of each other, in in certain in certain ways, and maybe in the structures of racism, the, the ways in which racism worked in both places. So I, I gave a tour today, and I mentioned about hotels in the United States. You know, some hotels had restrictions on Jews. Those hotels, and um, someone asked me, "Well, was there a green book for Jews and traveling to the United States?" It's like, no, there actually there wasn't. Was there? Okay, but there were uh, there were lots of hotels where right. Jews could stay, so it wasn't like the yeah, American experience traveling to those places. I'm horrified. I didn't know. There were neighborhoods. So let me. Uh, Dr. Cockrell, my books that some of which he held up, but you might want to go to the front and look more closely. Also, because we went right into questions, she did not get the well deserved ovation from one of the best. I'm sure she'd be happy to stay and answer questions. Let me also point out finally, there is new art on the wall and new writing. So, it'll be here for a while from the art writing content. So, read the writing, look at the art, and see you in a month at the, at the brunch. Please sign up to help.